master of PhDs and postdocs um, at home with, if you were wondering who was sending you the influx of messages lately. So it is my pleasure to introduce to you the Director of Professional Development and Career Office at the East Baltimore campus, PDCO, Dr. Patricia Phelps, whose bio you may have already read. What is not in her bio is that Pat is very knowledgeable in a large number of topics and has graciously, graciously offered, although she's not feeling 100% uh, well right now, to take this unique challenge of presenting this overview to a very, very, very diverse group of people. So thank you, Pat. And before I hand things over to Pat, please just make sure to mute your microphones. If you do have questions uh, during her presentation, use the chat box or turn on your video and mic at the end to ask questions. Uh, this session will be recorded uh, to provide the, the video to those that cannot attend right now. So over to Pat. Uh, thanks so much, Roshni, and um, thanks to the um, Futures and also the Johns Hopkins Postdoc Association for um, having me speak today about the academic job search. Um, what I wanted to do today is first I just want to um, recognize that we're speaking today to a very broad disciplinary audience. I've tried to throw in resources and suggestions that fit both the humanities as well as the STEM disciplines, um, you know, but just want to get y'all all on the same page with me that it's hard to speak specifically to such a broad audience. But if you have any questions, please send them in the chat room. And if we can't answer them all today, I promise that I'll follow up and try and answer them the best I can. And if I can't answer them, I'll contact faculty colleagues that can help get me the right information. But with that said, what I wanted to do today is first talk about the academic job search timeline. Um, I want to talk a little bit about assessing your readiness. It's one key question I get a lot from postdocs is, how do I know when I'm ready to go on the job search market? Um, the next thing I wanted to do is talk about the job search itself, um, talk a little bit about where to find jobs and what you should be doing to find jobs then go in very briefly about the job search documents. I'm just going to talk a little bit about the CV, cover letters, research statements, um, because there's many more um, seminars in this series that are more focused on those topics, and then a little bit about resources. And all along the way, there are going to be areas where I'm going to ask everyone to share their knowledge um, about the academic job search series because one thing that I think I always like to emphasize is your colleagues are many times the best chance or the, a really great source of information and resource for you but I think sometimes we always forget to ask our peers and our colleagues and our friends some of the information that we're seeking. So with that I'm going to go ahead and get started. The first thing I wanted to do is just sort of a big picture overview of the academic job search timeline. What you can be doing now, what you should start doing in the fall, in the winter, and in spring. So traditionally speaking, the academic job search is a one-year cycle. Um, and sometimes you're, you're thinking that at this moment you're not really ready to enter to, to take an academic position. But I want to encourage everyone to think that you need to think about it. Will you be ready in a year to assume an academic faculty position? Because it's going to be a year from now or actually a year from the fall that you would actually be started. So you almost have to think ahead of when you'll be ready to start. And so what can you be doing right now? Um, the most important things you can be doing are definitely publishing starting to network, starting to build those networks, starting to think about who your letters of recommendation will be from, and starting to ask those people if they would give you an excellent letter of recommendation. I think that's always a good place to start, not just ask for a letter of rec, but make sure that they're going to give you an outstanding letter of recommendation. Um, and it's also a good time to start updating your CV. You don't have to have it in final form, but start organizing it, updating it, so that burden of adding new information 
doesn't take place when things start getting more time consuming, you know, when you start writing your research statement, et cetera. And it's also a good time to start gathering some of that information that you might need to start creating those job applications materials like your teaching statement or your research statement. And I'll talk a little bit more about this subject in a future slide. And then starting October, you know, August, October in the fall, that's the time to start really getting your application packet together. Um, you can meet with Roshni, um, you know, and even the Teaching Academy one-on-one -on -one appointments to get your application materials reviewed like your CV or even talking about strategies of how to develop those materials. Um, this is the time to start looking for jobs and finding jobs. And also, you know, October, November, it's the time to start applying for jobs. And then October to January, you know, this sometimes is the time of stress because you're just sort of sitting back waiting. Um, there's still job applications coming or jobs being announced, so you're still applying for jobs. And sometimes, you know, you'll start scheduling interviews now. Um, it's a great time to start practicing your job talk with your peers, with your mentor. And also, I highly recommend practicing your interview skills. Again, make an appointment with Roshni or an appointment with anyone else, your mentor, to you know, practice those job interview questions and, and think, start thinking and getting you know, comfortable with what that, in, you know, that online interview, those first phone screen interviews is going to be like and then what those in-person interviews are gonna be like. And I think, you know, doing a phone interview or a Skype interview and doing an in-person interview, all three of those are very different experiences. And it's not a bad idea to have a colleague or a mentor do a phone interview practice with you, a Skype interview practice with you, and an informal interview practice with you. January to April, that's when you're gonna start going to interviews. And you'll also see, you know, job opportunities reposted if they didn't, if they had a failed search. Um, so still, it's a time to apply. I think more and more the applications or job announcement just don't come out in a specific period, but they're coming out all year long. And then April to June, that's the time for the second interviews or the on-site interviews and the negotiation process. So again, it's a time between April and June to really be thinking about what you need if you've been successful getting views on site and you think you're going to be getting an offer, then you know you need to be thinking about what equipment you need or what resources you need or what salary you need or what student support or administrative support you're going to need to be successful in that job. Um, and so that's sort of a big picture overview. The next thing I want to talk about is before you even start the job search, thinking about well, are you ready? And then also thinking about what type of institution and what type of job that you really want to search for. I want to highlight a resource, the Academic Career Readiness Assessment out of the University of California, San Francisco. I think this is an amazing tool. They continue to update it. It's a great resource for many reasons and I'm going to talk about those at length. Um, this tool is actually a rubric, one that um, American Med Medical Association Innovation and Research and Research Awards in 2019. So it's been recognized nationally. It's a tool that you can use to access career readiness for all types of institutions, for research intensive institutions, for predominantly undergraduate institutions where you might be doing a combination of research and teaching, and also for predominantly teaching institution. They collected the data and information from faculty and department chairs at each of these specific types of institutions, and they continue to update the tool with new information now that it's becoming nationally recognized and also feedback from people that have used the tool. In addition to the tool being on the website that I have listed here, they have built out additional resources on exploring careers, applying for careers, and preparing for faculty careers using this, this tool as a, like a hub for everything. And they have a lot of examples um, of academic career packages that are also useful. So um, with that, I want to show you a couple of pages from that tool. Um, 
this is actually not the tool itself, but a resource they've created for things you can be doing, skills you can be using or building to make yourself more competitive for ac academic um, faculty positions. This specific page that I'm showing here is for teaching only institutes. I'm sorry, that's my dog. Um, he might bark occasionally. But for teaching only institutions, and it shows two categories here, a level of training that's required. Basically, this is the and then additional levels of training that you can get to become more competitive or for more demanding positions. So on the left side, you'll see the different qualifications like teaching experience, pedagogical practices, ability to serve a diverse student population, and even recommendations. And then for the basic level, um, for example, for teaching experience, if you're interested in teaching at a teaching only institution, you really have to have taught a course and be that faculty or instructor on record for that course. Um, that's almost a basic requirement for being competitive for e any type of position if you're predominantly going to teach. Um, if you want to get additional levels of experience or additional training, then organizing and teaching a variety of courses with the community college students or at an undergraduate teaching institution. Um, there's lots of ways that you can gain this experience. I think the teaching academy we have is an excellent opportunity to not only teach a course, but also to develop new course, um, you know, new, a new course, or even to do research on, you know, teaching. So you have the opportunity now to gain these skills with the Teaching Academy at Johns Hopkins. Um, pedagogical practice, again, you have an opportunity at the Teaching Academy to, to gain these skills. I'm not gonna go through the rest of this slide, the basic and the um, advanced requirements because you need those yourselves. You know, I do wanna take a moment to make sure that you, you know, if you're really interested in teaching, it's critical that you teach a diverse student population and gain those skills and even you know, develop a very good diversity statement. So now is a great time to be honing these skills or advancing these skills. In contrast, if you're interested in a research intensive institution, then the baseline skills that you need and the advanced skills that you need are different. So for instance, if you're interested in a research intensive faculty position, um, looking at publications and scholarships, the base is that a trainee has produced first author papers during their postdoc and also during their PhD with at least one paper that's contributed significantly to the field. And when you're writing your research statement and your CV, you really need to call that information out and just make it stand out. Um, I think we're all as academics taught not to um, boast and taught to be modest and careful about what we say, but you really have to, you know, get outside of your comfort zone and boast a little bit, market yourself more aggressively in these academic packages. For that same publication and scholarship for the more demanding positions, then the key skill that's needed is a trainee that has produced first author papers during their postdoc and PT. PhD, and at least one of these published in Cell, Nature, or Science. Um, it's not a requirement, you know, for um, a great faculty position, but definitely the more competitive positions, it really helps to have these um, premier publications or these vanity publications. I do want to also talk about a research vision and strategy because as I review um, research statements or CVs, um, a lot of times postdocs don't make this clear enough. You really need to have a clear research vision and strategy that is exciting. It comes across in your documents that you're excited about it and also that it's an independent research strategy and vision that's not similar to your current PI or mentor. So it has to be, again, an re exciting research program that people readily see why it's important it includes explicit feasible steps of how you're going to attain this direction over the first couple of years and also long term. It's an interesting broad research question that fills important gaps in the field. 
and you can provide direction for the next five to 10 years. It's not a question that you can answer in one to three years, but a question that's going to, you know, continue to need to be researched in the next five to 10 years and that you can break this question down into smaller feasible projects while also seeing the broader impact 10 years down the line. Um, and, and last but not least, I think I've touched about research independent, but your funding plan. Um, you know, if you haven't gotten a KO1, if you haven't demonstrated funding and you're not ready to go on the academic research track, I think this is a really important thing to do. It's not a deal breaker, but definitely if you have a demonstrated a record of fundability, it's going to help you a lot. Um, giving a travel award or a travel to a conference is not really in this category. It doesn't really count for demonstrating funding success. Um, and it's good to show when you're writing your research statement how you're going to fund your research. So with that, I'm going to go on to the next slide, but glad to answer any questions about this. And like I say, there's tons of information on this website that I've given you about the ACRA, how to use it, and, and all these resources. And one reason I'm really honing down on this ACRA and what you can be doing now is unfortunately the current job market situation is could be challenging, um, basically due to COVID-19. Um, I think it's uncertain right now how robust the academic job market's going to be. So I'm going to encourage us all to reframe our thinking, you know, and think about, well, if it's not going to be a strong academic job market this year, how can I take this time? How can I take this time right now to look at how competitive I am, what skills I can be building, what I can be doing? Can I be teaching a course? Can I be teaching, you know, taking online pedagogy training? Um, can I be doing online teaching? I think, you know, that could be a wave of the future. If it's research, can I be publishing? If I can't be in the lab right now, can I write a review article? You know, really brainstorming and maybe we can share ideas on the chat room right now, things that we can be doing as a postdoc to prepare ourselves um, for the next academic job search cycle if this one is not going to be extremely strong. And again, by using that ACRA, looking Using that tool, if you look at the tool itself, it's going to be more categories than the two slides I showed you. It's going to be from basic even up to advanced. You know, sit down with your mentor and go through that tool, assess yourself, talk to other postdocs, get a real clear level, you know, get a clear idea of what's the best thing that you can do to spend your time to make you more competitive for the type of job that you want. So review those categories with your mentor and then validate your readiness with peers who were successful on the job market last year um, before you. You know, I think it's always a great time if you have people that entered the academic job market last year, look at their CV, their resume, their research statement, get them to share it with you. You know, how do you compare next to them? Even if it was two or three years ago, someone that left your lab and, and got an assistant advisor position, you know, how are you stacking up against them and have an honest conversation with your mentor or even contact them and, and get their input on where you might improve to be competitive in the academic job search market. I've got a couple of slides that I prepared for the East Baltimore campus that I'm not going to go through since we have a broad audience, but it's an activity that you can do yourself. Um, these are different postdocs um, that were in schools of public health and got um, faculty positions um, the last few years. So I have listed where their postdoc institution was, um, the length of their postdoc, how they, long they did a postdoc, the institution where they got a job, how many first author publications they got, and how many second Public, author publications they had. And it's all over the board. You know, a publication is not equal to another publication. It depends on where that, you know, article was published and how it transformed the field. So you just have to take this as a broad brush, but it's something that you can definitely be doing, you know, if you know that you want to get a position at a specific institution, what did the um, qualifications of those new assistant professors look like when they got that job. Um, and I also used a search committee chair, it was at University of Maryland for a position in public health. 
um, what the arbitrary cutoff was for publications for their job search. And they basically said their arbitrary cutoff was first six first author papers, but it also depended on how long they'd been out of school, where they had published, what their research area was, what their funding was, and other factors as well. So it's really the package of who you are, not just one specific um, criteria. Looking more at STEM disciplines on the East Baltimore campus, now you'll see for STEM, the average length of the postdoc grows, goes up dramatically. So again, how many years you're doing a postdoc is gonna be specific to your field. Um, again, I list the different names, the different postdoc institutions, the length of their postdoc, the institution where they got their position, how many first author um, papers they had, if they had any nature sales papers, and if they had a K99 or K01 or any you know, grants um, that were significant. The next thing I want everyone to think about or take time to think about in addition to how ready or how competitive you are and what you can do to become more competitive and what's the main thing you can do to become more competitive is what is the right position for you? You know, there's a whole gamut of institutions going from predominantly teaching to predominantly research. So where do you want to be on that continuum? Where are you the best fit on that continuum? And where should you be applying? Because that's going to change your application materials. It's going to change, you know, how competitive you are. And I really don't, I personally don't recommend anybody be trying to do two types of institutions because I think that it stretches you too thin and you're not as, you're most competitive right now for one particular type of institution. And what is that? And there should be one that you're targeting. Um, and, and I don't know if Kelly Clark's on the, on the um, you know, call, but please feel free, Kelly, to add any comments about your opinions on this um, situation as well or anything else that I'm saying. And Roshni, you please do the same. And then the next thing I think, you know, in this world that we live in today, you know, the gold standard used to be a tenure track position, but that's not the gold standard anymore. And I wanted to take a minute to talk about tenure track versus non-tenure track positions. Um, according to the AAUP, non-tenure track faculty positions now account for more than 70% of teaching appointments at U.S. institutions. Um, I think a big reason for this is financially it's not that institutions don't have the money to fund you year after year but because it doesn't hit the bottom line forever if it's an annual reportment then the way that it hits the budget of an institution is different um, so non-tenure track positions don't impact long-term budget projections for institution that have to be approved by higher powers like the board of directors or the board of trustees so even though they have the money, it, it's different if they host it as a non-tenure track on their budgets. Nowadays, most institutions treat both tracks equally where non-tenure track positions come with a contract and full benefits and you really don't see the difference. Um, there's been research looking at the um, satisfaction levels of tenured versus non-tenure track faculty, such as the one pub published by Ott and Cicernos in the Education Policy Analysis Archives 2018. They found really no difference. 86% um, of non-tenured faculty stated that they would choose the same career path that were polled. Um, but I do wanna make a note here that it can be difficult to switch from one track to the other. So it's hard if you, you know, I wouldn't go into a non-tenured track position thinking that when you're there for several year, years, you can switch to a tenure track faculty position. Um, it's not that easy. But I did want to make the point that, you know, everything I'm hearing, for the most part, there's no difference between these two types of positions. And so I think it's also important to think about what's the right institution for you. Um, you need to think about geographic considerations, where you want to live. Um, I'm not going to harp on this again, but again, fit with your own credentials, um, your partner and family considerations, life work balance. I think there's a life work balance difference between those different institutions we talked about, whether it's predominantly teaching or predominantly research. Also, the financial implications, the cost of living at different places, 
and also the institutional overhead cost. I want to spend a minute just making sure everybody's aware of the difference between the institutional overhead costs. I'm not going to go into this in detail. Um, here's slides. You can send me questions about this after the talk if you want to know more about it. But just for instance, the overhead costs at different institutions are different. So I thought MIT had a great graphic. Their overhead cost is 54%. And what that means is you get a research grant, 28% of that every dollar you don't see, it's going to go to the institution. The institutions all divide that up differently. So some of that overhead actually could come back to you at some institutions. At some institutions, it doesn't. But 72% of that dollar that you write that grant for is going to come into your, your hands that you can use to use your research. Um, these are some institutions I looked up for indirect cost. Harvard's at 69%. Johns Hopkins at 63.75%. Those indirect costs can differ between biology departments and school of medicine departments. The University of Maryland's at 54%. Towson's at 46.5%. I think another thing that's important to, to understand that the cost for graduate students and even the cost for postdocs, what you have to pay, if you have to pay for a graduate student or postdoc, can vary different, can vary greatly from institution to institution. You know, how many training grants do they have to help support graduate students? So these are things I would look at as you were looking at different institutions to apply for, or even when you're negotiating with different institutions. So just going back to the job search process itself, um, before the job search, things that you can be doing, we've already talked about. I think one thing that it didn't emphasize, <laughs> emphasize earlier is networking. Now, we can't go to conferences right now, so that makes it even more challenging. But as soon as that conferences start happening again, this is a great place to let everybody know that you're on the job search market, to do networking, to look for um, you know, opportunities or job announcements or job opportunities in your discipline. You, know, you can think about right now, maybe you can serve on committees for your association, um, committees for conferences that you can get on. It's a great work place to network, a great place for people to get to know you. you know, volunteer for these committees. Um, I always like to tell people to develop a list of targeted institutions that they're interested in. Sometimes, you know, you can follow their Twitter feeds, their job posts, their LinkedIn, or even look at their, their websites for jobs and start networking at those institutions. Um, again, get your materials up to speed, look at your letter recommendations, and more and more and more um, job searches are going to be on social media, on Facebook, on Twitter, on LinkedIn. You know, so in, diff in addition to conferences, your professional societies, scientific journals, and institutional websites, LinkedIn is a, and social media is a great place to look for, for jobs. And what I'd like to do now is get everybody to, in the chat room, there are also LinkedIn groups, there's Twitter feeds, there's Twitter groups of postdocs and people looking for academic jobs where they're announcing things, they're sharing resources. So if you're on any of those social media sites and you recommend them, can you put those in the chat room now? And also put what discipline it's for, like if it's humanities, is it social sciences, is it STEM, if it's biomedical, so everybody can better you know, know that that's a resource for that specific discipline. So please, if everybody can share great social media sites or great job site right now where you can find jobs, can you please share those with your colleagues? The last thing that I like to tell everybody is to inform your network um, you are ready to enter the job market. You have to put it out to the universe and let people know that you're entering the job market and get their help. You could find out about a job that you didn't know about and you could get recommended for a job that you might not have known about or applied for or not even thought that you were eligible for just because your network holds you in higher esteem than sometimes we hold ourselves. So tell friends, you never know who they know, tell colleagues, tell your peers, tell the community, you know, just let people know that you're on the job search and what you're looking for. Um, 
you just never know where a connection can happen. I know someone that found an academic position at the gym has told someone they were working out with that they were on the academic job search market. So it never hurts to put it out in the universe. Um, I've got a list of websites where you can find jobs. I think, you know, these are helpful, but again, I think more and more it's moving to social media. But again, if you want to enter any job search job, website for jobs that you think is great that's not on this list, please also put that in the chat room. Um, this was a fun resource, I thought. I'm going to you know, highlight a few points that I want to make using this research. But it was an evolutionary biologist, biology postdoc that was looking for a faculty job. And he did a blog post on his search. Um, he actually did two academic job search cycles. This is not unusual. You know, I always encourage you, if you're, you're not sure you're ready, to go ahead and go on the academic job search, even if you're not right, quite ready, because you learn so much by getting your application materials ready for looking for jobs, by applying to jobs, by you know, doing interviews, if you can get a phone interview, you learn a lot through the cycle. We've never done this before. Um, no one trained you to do it. We're not an expert by doing it. So the way to get good at it is to do it, you know, to practice it. So, you know, not everybody's successful on the academic job search cycle the first time, but a lot of people have much more success the second time around. It's not a great thing to hear, but it's just reality. So this individual ended up submitting 112 applications overall, got 70 interviews um, through Skype or on phone, 11 campus visits, and three offers. Um, and he has graphs of how many applications he applied for. You can see that, you know, they applied for, it's a guy, so applied for much less jobs the second time around, learned better of what types of jobs to apply for, you know, had better success um, getting interviews and invited to speak. The second slide shows what, you know, the applications were asking for. 38% asked for the publications. 57% asked for letters in advance. 9% asked for diversity statement. I think the percentage of institutions that are asking for diversity statements is growing. Kelly, if you want to comment on that right now, please do. 4% um, asked them to identify whether they were LGBTQ. Um, did the size of the institution matter, the size of the institution they were applying for, and whether they got interviews or visits? The one thing that I wanted to speak to, did the taxon matter, or did the type of position that they were applying to matter? And this is something I see time and time again with the postdocs that I work with. You can't just, you know, I don't think that they have a lot of success applying to jobs that they think they could do, but like if they're a cell biologist, they see a developmental biologist position that uses cell biology and they apply to that thinking that they can do it, but they have more success applying to cell biologist position because the competition for the developmental biologist position have been doing developmental biology. So my one thing that I wanna suggest is the more you can stay in your wheelhouse. I mean, if you see something that's very exciting and you still wanna apply for it, by all means do. It doesn't mean that it can't be successful, but you know, it's a lot of work to put these applications together. Um, you need to write tailored cover letters. You need to adjust your research statement and CV. Everything needs to be tailored for each position. Um, this isn't something that you can write one application package and send it to every job application. It needs to fit the job application or the job announcement. So it's a lot of work. So the point I want to make is the more that you can find positions that are a great fit for you and spend most of your time on those positions, I think the better success you'll have and you won't stress yourself out as much because, you know, we're all still trying to do our research and our teaching as well as applying for these jobs. This is an example of a recent search at the University of Maryland for an open rank position. I talked to the chair. Um, I just want to give some quick statistics. Um, he recommends candidates develop their own line of research, but be broad enough to talk to different groups. 
having one more line, having more than one line of research or one project can be advantageous, not only because if something doesn't go well, but also from granting mechanisms and to showcase that in, in your application materials. They had 94 applications for this position, 70 were competitive, 30 were seriously considered. They did 12 phone interviews. And the key difference here was those who had researched the department and the faculty and demonstrated interest in their position in the department and, and the questions that they asked. So that's what made the difference um, on the phone interviews on those who came to the campus interviews. So it's very important. And that again is why it's so much work. You need to research the faculty and the, the institution and the position that, and the department that you're applying to. And Kelly, again, please feel free to jump in if you have any points or that you wanna make on this. Factors in the final decision was the publications, the area of research, the number of publications, the journals and what authorship they had, evidence of grants and funding, area of research and whether it was fit with the department and the subject and the teaching experience. Um, so I hope all that's helpful in helping you understand your fit and where you want to apply. Just going in a, a little bit more in depth but not as in depth as future seminars into the application materials. So in the fall and you can start doing it now you know if you can't be at full function because of COVID but preparing your application materials, you'll need a CV, a cover letter, a research statement, um, possibly a diversity statement, you know, a teaching statement. Again, a teaching statement is very different for the different types of institutions that you're applying for. If it's a predominantly teaching institution, you might need a whole teaching portfolio. Um, I think it's a great idea to set up a tracking system for your job search. And I understand also there's tools out there to manage your reference letters, but I like a tracking system to document the source where you found the job, um, the application date that you submitted it, make sure you save a copy of the ad because I know that I've applied for jobs sometimes. And by the time that I hear about an interview and I'm, I'm getting ready to go on an interview, they've taken down the job announcement or the job ad and I can't remember what they were looking for. So I always now save those job ads, save a copy of the application materials that you use to apply for that job and you know who your references were. So keep track of all this stuff. Um, and for the humanities people out there, because I am doing a lot of um, the talk talking about STEM and my STEM references. I found a, what I thought was a good resource for you through Stanford Humanities Department, and it had some example of job application materials for humanities. Just a little bit about the academic CV. I know this is the next session that in this series, but again, it's a marketing document. You've got to sell yourself. I think it's important to think about what your key attributes are. What makes you different from your peers? Is it teaching? Is it the kind of teaching you did? Is it something about your research? Have you been really good at publications? Have you really been good at having a novel area of research? Um, have you been good at building collaborations? Is it funding? You know, think about your skill set. What is your brand? You know, spend some time to think about that before you start doing your CV, your cover letter, your research statement. You really need to write the CV as an independent investigator. You need to say I, not we. You can't write it as a postdoc. I can't tell you how many research statements or CVs I get that just don't seem like, you know, you need to write it like you're an assistant professor. They come across more about the task that you've done, you know, the team, more about the group. You really have to talk about your vision and what, where you're going. Um, and we have a lot of examples on our website, the PDCO, and that resource comes a little bit later. Examples of um, successful academic job search packages, and you can read the research statements. I'm also going to send out, well, I've created a research statement checklist and a CV checklist that I'm going to send Roshni to give to everybody. This is a great thing to do or give to your mentor to check off or even to give to a, you know, you can get together with a peer that's on the job search cycle. It's a great thing, you know, 
to find someone else, another postdoc that's on the job search cycle in a similar discipline and sort of be buddies, check each other's applications, you know, you know, be stress relief buddies, be, you know, cheerleaders for each other, but you know, we're all in this together. Make it visually appealing. Yeah. Oh, sorry. This oh, is sorry. Kelly here. I just, Kelly, um, yeah. I just, um, before we kept going, I'm sorry to interrupt, but there was a question in the chat about the UMD chair that I wanted to raise that didn't get answered. And um, they're asking with that respect to that, did you find there, did they, was there a trade off between multidisciplinary versus expertise? And is there a fine line? So I think, and, and maybe they can hop on, um, the question is about maybe showcasing. Uh, yourself as an expert in one particular area versus kind of um, all across disciplines, if I understand the question. Yeah, Kelly, thanks for bringing that up. I, I, I misspoke then if, if people think that you want to be a jack of all trades. You definitely want to be an expert in a research area, but within a research area, is your project broad enough, your skill set broad enough that you can have different projects or different lines of research as an expert in that area. Does that make better sense, Kelly? Yes, I think so. And I would just add too, I think it's really in terms of going back to researching the position and the institution, that's where you, if you have research that crosses disciplines, that's where you really want to play to the strength of, of that and fit yourself, find out if there's a good fit for you there. So I know it's very individual what I found in terms of consulting with grad students and postdocs on the position. Um, and if you can find out really what they're looking for, you may be able to um, find a nice niche for yourself in that in that search if that makes sense, that makes sense. So, so and that's a great point Kelly and, and again I didn't mention this before but you, you, you remind me it's so hard doing this <laughs> online without seeing everybody and being able to get the questions and I'm not looking at the chat questions so thanks for letting me know but a lot of times positions job announcements you can't really tell what they're looking for and so if you can call and just ask the chair or the search committee more information about what they're looking for, or if you can network and have a colleague and any homework you can do to find out more about that position, I think that can be very helpful. Would you agree to that, Kelly? Yes, I definitely would agree. I mean, sometimes um, even though their department may not have the area of your research per se, they may be looking to hire some, you know, someone to build out a new, area for them or a new department or it's just it's a very case-by-case -case, um thing so i think it's hard to generalize other than i think that's a great suggestion to reach out to somebody the chair any any contact they give to it's you're well within your rights to ask more questions to find out as much as you can yeah and i think they'll respect that too and you know, the more again, that's why networking is so important because sometimes you'll find out someone's looking for your skill set that you didn't know about. Kelly, were there any other questions that came up in the past sections that we should stop and talk about, or should I go on? Um, I think we've covered everything. Every there was a few questions just about will the slides be shared in the recording, and um, I assumed and and Roshni jumped in as well that it would be fine with you if the slides and the recording were shared with the attendees. Yeah, definitely. Great. And Pat, I just right. wanted to add, maybe in the last uh, few minutes after you're done, we'll just open up for questions as well. Sure. Um, I'm, that'd be great. Um, so let me get through these last two slides, and then maybe we can mo open it up for questions and be more interactive. But um, you know, the visually appealing, the more you know, we have faculty panels for the last five years. And they all stress, you know, they don't want to read tons of material. The research statement should be like, you know, more than, you know, two pages is great. And just make it easy for them to get the information. Um, you can do this by having clearly defined sections like teaching, mentoring. Don't try and put everything in one section and highlight your strengths and guide the reader. So, again, once you figure out what your brand, what your greatest strengths are, if you've been great at funding, Move funding to the top of your CV. 
if you've been great at, you know, research publications, find a way to highlight that front and center, you know, grab their attention as great as you can. So order things to your advantage. The other thing I like to say is I see a lot of CVs coming in and it's some, it's a postdoc applying for a research position and they've got great creds. They've got great publications. They've got a funding record, but they've been so productive that they've done a lot of service. They've done a lot of mentoring. They've done a lot of teaching. They've done a lot of extracurricular activities. They've done a lot of service. So they put everything on their CV um, and it ends up that the research takes about one third or sometimes even only 25% of their CV, and the rest is filled with teaching, with service, and everything like that. And that's not good, because if you're applying for a research position, you want to come across as strong a researcher as you can, because otherwise, even though you are, you're not branding yourself right by putting everything on there. So be careful about the percentage of your CV content that focuses on the things you need to focus on. You still want to add all that stuff because you want to show that you do service. You want to show that you're a good citizen and you can teach, but you know, make it take less space, make it more impactful. Reverse chronological order UCVs, you know, the United States CVs don't include pictures or personal inf in information. So understand the, um, norms or the conventions of the country that you're applying for. So conversely, if you're a US citizen applying to um, positions overseas, their norms are gonna be different from ours. Um, so the, I also see a lot of times curriculum beta at the top of a page that shouldn't be there. Your name should be the first piece of information, in my opinion. Again, think about what different, differentiates you um, and focus on your accomplishments, not your duties. So this is an example, again, of something that you might put in there for your teaching experience, so cell biology one-on-one, -on -one, one, that could be different at multiple institutions and putting down that you graded paper and prepared lectures, that's pretty much a given. So how can you emphasize your skills better and more impactfully? I think saying that you were the lead instructor for a cell biology course for advanced undergraduates gives a lot more information and that you updated the curriculum through the introduction of case studies shows that you're innovation, innovative, you're using active teaching methods, and that you're taking lead in teaching. Kelly, anything you wanna say about that? Nope, I think those are nope, all I great points. Okay, thanks Kelly. Um, so the next thing is the cover letter. I've already mentioned this, but you wanna tailor it to each job. Try and catch the reader's attention in the first paragraph. I don't really like to see the standard productory um, first paragraph on the CV without anything special about yourself. Huh? I even like to tell people if it's hard, I like using the one, two, three technique. Think about your brand. What are the best three attrib attributes you have? And so in the last sentence of that cover letter, say, I'm a great fit for this position because of X, Y, and Z. And then you can use paragraph two to talk about X, paragraph three to talk about why in paragraph four to talk about Z and then close with your fit and the potential collaborators. So that's one way you can write a cover letter. Here's some prompts I think are great if you want to use them for writing a cover letter. Um, you know, writing a cover letter is not easy. Writing anything is not re easy. So one thing to do is just start writing. You know, don't try and make that first sentence perfect or don't try and make that first paragraph perfect. So you can use these prompts to just first start writing and getting information down and then go back and edit it and then go back and put it in paragraph form and then go back and, and make sure it makes a nice story. So, you know, start that way. Um, here's some things that you can use in an open opening paragraph and view this first paragraph as your 30 second commercial that makes the search committee want to read more. Okay. And here's other things that you can put in that opening paragraph. Here's another suggested cover letter layout if you don't want to use the one, two, three. Paragraph one should be about the position, you know, and make an impact statement, you know, like I've talked about before. Paragraph two, what are your areas of expertise? What have you accomplished? Highlight your strengths. Paragraph three, talk about your research vision, why it's relevant. Make sure you 
you make it come across as exciting and innovative. Again, fit. You need to mention fit. Paragraph four, maybe how you can contribute to the department and what things you've done that demonstrates that you can do these things. So you always have to not just tell me you can do things, but show me how you can do things. This is really, really important in a teaching statement. Don't just tell me you can use case studies, but give me an example of a case study that you created or used. Show me how you do these things. Um, and, and five, express enthusiasm, talk about the colleagues, the department and institution, and maybe about funding fit. Um, purpose, you know, how do you show purpose? Answer the question, why must this research be done? Convince the search committee that you will succeed. Just, I think this is out of order, guys, so I'm sorry. I think this has to do with the research statement. Um, describe your short-term and long-term goals in your research. So your research is independent from your advisor. Demonstrate ability to garner funding and excite them about having you as a colleague. And we have more materials on doing a research statement on our website. The research statement, you know, again, why is your research important? Have you advanced the field? Make your significant accomplishment stands out. Talk about your research to date. Not too much of your research statement should be about what you've done in the past, but where you're going in the future, not just short term, but long term. A lot of it should be doing about where you're going in the short term, but also the long term too. It's got to be a nice balance and everything has to fit together as a story. You know, hopefully you can tie in your PhD research to your postdoc research where that's going as a new faculty member. And will you be a good addition to that um, department? Formatting again, one to two pages, no more than five, three pages. I can't tell you how many um, research statements I get that's five pages. They're reading hundreds of these guys, so make it short, make it impactful. If you can use images, use images. Um, you can even use informative headers in your research statement to break it up and to call attention to parts that they might want to see. You can use bullets, use an easily readable font size, make the margins a reasonable size, don't fill the page you know, make it, don't make it two pages by making narrow margins, avoid jargon and keep it at a summary level and give details in your job talk. There's two standard format research statements. One's the chronological, that's basically an executive summary, what you did for your graduate search research, what you did for your postdoc, and then what you did for your future research. Then there's the topical, it's chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, and it ties what you've done in the past the present and the future all together. Um, those are different topics and we have examples of those on, your, on our um, website. We've heard from faculty that they enjoy the topical more than they do the chronological. But I'm sure that as you get into the research statement webinar in this series, you'll learn more about those things. Um, again, this is just a little bit of insights about the interviews. So again, be ready for your phone or Skype interviews. They could come really quick if a department's excited about you. So be ready or just wait because a lot of the calls come January, watch for new jobs, schedule your interviews. You know, this can be really tricky. I always like to tell everybody, try and do your first interview at a job that you're not as excited about. Save, you know, you know get some practice under your belt before you do your interview at your the job that you're most excited about. That can easily change when you go in the interview, but schedule your second choice jobs interviews first. And try and not schedule more than one interview a week. It really is exhausting and time consuming and you wanna be on your best. Um, discuss the interview and do mock interviews. Again, practice your job talk. And then here's a list of resources I put together that I feel really good and I tried to find some for um, humanities and for biomedical research. So again, sorry I, I rushed so much at the end. Uh, I hope it was really helpful and I'll be glad to take questions now. Hi, Pat. Hi. Um, Pat Zach had a question. Zach, you turn your microphone on and ask your question. Zach? Zach says, uh, so should I underreport my non-research experience and work if I'm applying to my research position? Doesn't it show persistence and contributions in the field and out? Yes, Zach. Um, 
That's a great question. You should not underreport it. I think what I'm recommending is, you know, find ways to report it concisely so that all those things don't take up too much of your CV so that the key things that the department are looking for are highlighted. I hope that makes sense. And again, it's very discipline specific. I think all those extracurricular activities may be more important in some disciplines than others. So that's why it's always important to have your mentors or your faculty members or mentors at other institutions review your CV. D does that answer your question, Zach? He may have, he may uh, have, 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 I don't know, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. But any other questions? But any other questions? Kelly has been fantastic, has been fantastic answering, questions, answering uh, questions in the chat, uh, window, in the chat window fact. Oh, great. Thanks, Kelly. Um, there's a question. What are the implications of high versus low institutional overhead? Um, how much of your grant dollars you get? So if it's high institutional overhead and you might not necessarily need all the instrumentation and the resources that that institution offers it just means that you're going to get less of your grant dollars to do your own research it's just something to be aware of you know um, you can calculate how much difference that would make in a one million dollar grant that you would have to spend any other questions from everybody you can turn your uh, microphone on now if you want to How does the postdoc job search compare to this process? Um, what process, Ashley? The academic job search. How does the postdoc job search compare to the academic job search? Um, <laughs> That's a lot to answer in a question. What I can do is um, we have some resources on um, looking for a postdoc that I can send you. Um, you know, you're, you're, you don't have to be as competitive on an independent line of research. When you're applying for a postdoc position, you're trying to complement your graduate student research with your postdoc position. You know, you're not, you don't want to enter the same field, so um, you want to build new skills, whether it's a new technique or working in a different model system or different area, using the same techniques. Um, so you're still training in a postdoc position. So, you know, that's different. You really want, you're more concerned about pedigree, so you want to go to a higher tier institution. So the type of institution that you're looking for for your training is very important, whereas you're getting position, you're, you're looking more for the fit and your job and what you want out of a career. Um, those are a few points. Um, hopefully that's helpful, and I'm glad to share with Rajni. If you email me even, you know, Rajni can send out my email. And I'm glad to answer any questions specifically and send you those specific resources or talk to you on the phone about finding a postdoc. But I'm sure Roshni would be great at that too, to make an appointment with her. Uh, so uh, I have a question, have a question. related to this. Um, like as you showed, it really matters that you have a lot of publications when you do the academic job search. And in terms of doing a postdoc, like uh, this, I feel like there's a trade-off between uh, learning new capabilities versus uh, using what you know very well and like publishing a lot of papers. And do you have any views or suggestions on like how to navigate that? Yeah, so again, it's discipline specific. Um, okay. You know, if you have, if you, if you don't have as many publications, but you are advancing the field more so, then that counts a lot. Um, you know, a lot of publications isn't necessarily great if they're not in high tier journals or they're not pushing the, the field forward. So, you know, you can have less publications that are more impactful. Um, if maybe you haven't done a lot of, you know, you know, not every research, and you know, too, 
different types of research have different yields in publication numbers, right? Some mm -hmm. research you can't publish as much as other types of research. And the people that are reviewing your application understand that. So that's why you can't, you know, compare apples to apples, you know. So the best thing I can do is using that ACRA tool or using your mentors, you know, how competitive do you think I am based on my publication record and my funding record and my service record? You know, your mentors are a really good judge of that. Um, and looking at what your peers have done. So, you know, there's no one formula for publications. It's a package. You know, if you don't have as many publications, but you've gotten funding or you've really, you know, interested in a teaching career, um, I hope that was helpful. So in terms of funding, what do you mean? Like, uh, like applying for funding with your postdoc advisor or independently? So not really with your postdoc advisor. It has to be independent funding. Um, okay. Postdocs that actually do help co-write a grant with their PI. So, you know, you can put down co-PI status, but definitely it's better if it's talked about by your recommendation letter. So if you're a postdoc in your situation where you have participated in grant writing or, or contributed significantly to grant writing with your PI, you need to have a conversation with them to make sure that that comes out in their letter of recommendation. It's better for them to say it than you say it and work with them on how you can list it on your CV. Kelly, okay. do you have any thoughts about that? Because that's a really tricky situation. Um, I have thoughts on the first one. I was actually answering um, somebody else in the chat, so I missed um, this last comment. Um, but I did, I guess, the comment I did and thoughts I did have to share were a strategy around the question kind of to dovetail what um, was said before about whether you um, choose a postdoc that is going to give you more publications in your field of expertise of your graduate work or do you look for a postdoc that is going to give you more research experience in a complementary area? Um, and mm -hmm. I, um, I think you're right, it's a balance and it's hard to predict what is the smartest way to go. I know um, all of some of the faculty I've worked with do meant, it, and I think it's going to be um, particular to your given field as well, whether it makes sense to um, have specific research in multiple kind of areas that, that complement each other um, or to stick to the same kind of trajectory and focus that you were taking with your graduate work. Um, but the faculty, at least that I've spoken to with the graduate students I've worked with, um, and these were more in engineering fields, were advising them to look for the, as a postdoc, as a way to expand your knowledge and research base. So to look for something a little bit different. But I do understand that you may see that as potentially um, an area where you might not be then able to publish as much. So. I don't know. We have, a, we have a question from Arzu who raised her hand. Uh, yeah, I actually, uh, I'm not sure like what's the best way to articulate the question, but um, it turns out that if you decide that you're not competitive for um, academic positions, uh, let's say this year, this coming year, um, what would be a good strategy um, to sort of um, become competitive next year because there are certain disciplines that if you if you stay in a postdoc position more than let's say two or three years that's not that's considered something that's not a good sign um so if if you're in a discipline like that what would be like your next best position for you to sort of stay within the academic community and stay being productive being able to publish do you have any recommendations in that regard what discipline are you in? Uh, engineering. Engineering. Right. Um, well, hopefully, if this isn't a strong job market, I think there's going to be some forgiveness for an additional postdoc year. Um, 
you know, it's hard for me to answer that question without knowing, you know, where you need to improve your competitiveness. I think, you know, your decision of what to do next should dovetail with what additional skill sets you need. Um, so, you know, yeah, I would, just, yeah, I would just advise it's, that's a good, um, this particular question for all of you is a good opportunity for them to meet one-on-one -on -one with Pat or myself or Roshni to be able to sit down and look at what your career goals are, what your current expertise and what your CV looks like now to then be able to figure out how you could best um, bolster that for this year. It could be, you know, depending on what your goals are, it could be um, strengthening the teaching aspect of your role. If you can show you're both um, great and stellar in your research and also have experience um, teaching a course, then that makes you more competitive for some of those academic positions where you're going to have those responsibilities. Uh, teaching online, that's going to be um, getting some experience like that, I think is going to you know, I, I don't know that we're going to ever go back to life as normal. I think there's going to be some, you know, uh, more movement into doing a lot of teaching and learning online as well. So I think that's something else to kind of consider. But again, I think it's a case by case basis. So good opportunity to reach out to one of us, uh, a mentor in your department to strategize uh, and then connect with the resources that we can put you in touch with at the university to help you gain those skills and experiences over this next year. Thank you so much, Kelly. I couldn't have said that better. And I wholeheartedly agree. And, you know, even with that point, I just want to make the statement that this presentation, the comments, their general recommendations, you know, each of you has a specific, unique situation. And you know you have to weigh everything according to what your needs are and where you're at and where you're going. On behalf of uh, the Futures Office and the Homewood Postdoc Association, I want to thank Kelly and Pat uh, for joining us and sharing their wisdom. Um, as we mentioned in the chat box, the next on the series is Kelly's session on academic CVs and cover letters. So hopefully you can join. After this session, we will send out um, a small, short survey. It takes about less than 30 seconds. So hopefully you guys can fill that out as well. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Thank you, Pat. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you, Ashley. Okay, bye, everyone. Pat? Hi, Pat, are you still there?